All right. Uh, hey, everybody. Welcome back to the second episode of Magical Space Pussycats. Thank you guys so much for joining us today. If you're a new listener, thank you for stopping by. If you've been here before, we are so glad to have you back. My name is Chelsea. I'm broadcasting today from Kansas, and I'm joined by a couple of lovely ladies. Hello, I'm Elizabeth. I'm better known as Books and Pieces on YouTube, and I'm coming to you from Wales in the UK. And I am Caitlin, and I'm better known as Kitty G on YouTube, and I'm coming from the London area in England. I am on YouTube as The Reading Outlaw, so you guys can always find us online in various places. Today we are going to be talking about Booktubeathon, Pokemon Go, Black Lives Matter, and of course it is award season. So we'll be talking about the World Fantasy Awards, the Gemmel Awards, and the British Fantasy Awards. So grab a cup of tea, buckle in, and uh, let's get started, ladies. Okay. All right. So the first thing we're going to talk about before everything is our current read. And at the moment in the Lady Vaults, we are exploring Sinners by Pat Cadigan. So how is everybody finding this? What are you thinking about your first Pat Cadigan read? Because I believe this is all of our first time reading something by her. Yes. Yes. Uh, <laughs> so far, so far. Yeah, it's <laughs> interesting. Um, it's interesting. It's It started out quite difficult to wrap my head around, I think, and I think we all agree on that. It's a little bit confusing in places at the yeah. beginning. Mm -hmm. However, as I got further through, I'm about like a third of the way into it now, and it is starting to make more sense. So I think that will be very comforting. Well, it's very comforting for me to hear at like... <laughs> 12% through and anybody else who happens to be reading along because yeah. the first four chapters are just new people, new things, new language, like You're mind. just thrown straight yeah. into it yeah. all, aren't you? <laughs> Man, it was that new language thing that really got me. I'm, yeah. I'm vaguely new to science fiction. Yeah, uh, me too. Like, especially like, I would not consider this necessarily like hard sci-fi but it's definitely harder science fiction than what i usually read which is more like yeah. the becky chambers route of <laughs> <Exactly>. science fiction <laughs> slightly so, more difficult yeah and so i think for me it was an adjustment to everything and learning how to sit with like uh like that panic that you get when you're like i don't know what's happening and nothing makes sense and just being like it's okay yeah. yeah, you still have a lot of the book to read. I'm sure just by the reading. end, just more things reading. will make sense. Yeah, exactly. It's a very, <laughs> uh, it's reading, a very yeah. dory kind of lifestyle. It like, is. Just it keep is. reading; it will all make sense. It's I think fine. that's a, something you learn reading more sci-fi because they tend to do that, like just flinging you into a world mm -hmm. and assuming you'll learn to swim eventually. Because there's so often it's like a new society or a society that is vaguely what ours is but with loads of new technology and with something like this where they've got lots of slang and you have to learn that as well you're kind of running to keep up with mm -hmm. multiple things at once and the plots going in and yeah they don't necessarily explain it in a way that it's not like a quest or something where there's yeah. like a standard narrative that you can follow they like throw lots of things in and then it'll make sense and mm. there's, there's mm -hmm. quite a few sci-fi books i've read that are like that and you just <laughs> learn to float for a bit <laughs> well that's the other thing that i thought was interesting is this book is so on point for having being written like decades ago like yeah, yeah reading yeah. about the technology and just being like yeah totally obviously that's like a thing and then but also like virtual reality and i mean we don't have implants but with the <laughs> yeah, way cell phone technology works <laughs> mobile devices basically you know um I just thought uh, any, we haven't really given a rundown of what this book is. If, oh, if yeah. anybody <laughs> didn't catch up on episode about. one. <laughs> yeah. Sinners is a um, cyberpunk science fiction novel from, I think it was nine, the very early 1990s. And it's set in a sort of near future world where there is advanced technology or what was advanced for the 1990s. Um, 
and it's all to do with uh, the sort of intersection between the brain and reality and computing and virtual reality. Um, and so there's lots of stuff to do with technology in it and um, like computer viruses and, and strange things like that. So yeah. that, that's why we keep talking about <laughs> like technology being interesting. The thing I so, find yeah. like really interesting about it is even though it is quite modern for its time and stuff, still you have the Y or N commands for like saying yes, yes or no to stuff, <laughs> which always just makes me think like, oh, this is still old school, even though it's got a lot of the new ideas. It's still a bit old school, too. Yeah, you're mm -hmm. still doing terminal line functions. Yeah, so it's quite yeah. amusing. That's but see, there. that's the kind of thing that I love because it manages to stay like feel so current. But at the same time, there are, like you're yeah. saying, just those little, little clues, clues that if you look for them, it dates the book in a way that feels very like nostalgic. So, like I can remember yeah. playing like early computer games and having to type in like line <laughs> function keys and having the computer be like, that is not a function. Like, please try again. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. Uh, I, li I like the atmosphere that it creates because it's like that th th it's futures of the past reading it now mm -hmm. I think reading it in the 90s it would have been incredibly futuristic because yeah. it's like you know these weird portable computers when computers really weren't like that it was much you know they're talking about things like they're Walkmans or something yeah. because it, like embedded into your glasses and um, which is so now, you know, think Google Glass and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, but it was that vision of the future of the 90s, and you see it in every era of science fiction, their version of the future, and it feels retro but futuristic at the same time, which is a really lovely thing to do. It's like that yeah. it's the 50s version of the future was all, like, sleek atomic stuff. and Yeah, like kitchen suits. robots and, like... <laughs> All kept, like, I want that version I was of say, I the wish future. That was real. <laughs> I'm still waiting for that version of the future yeah. to come true. Yeah, um, and and this is a '90s MTV generation version of the future. It's you know, um, well, yeah, like music videos and hackers and and punk kids, like, yeah. and like coding through music, like that, like. There are sections in the earlier part of the books where various pieces of computer information are transmitted through like musical tracks and hidden in entertainment that is at face value completely just entertainment. And which, you know, now we think of as something, you know, anything that's digital, you can encode more data mm -hmm. and information in. But at the time, like, I'm trying to imagine what it would have been like to have been, like, you know, listening to my early 90s, like, Jamiroquai, and at the same time, it's, like, <laughs> the com secret computer documents about, like, taking over the world or whatever, and it's just, that is so, yeah, that's right, ladies. Very, like, smiles, We partied it up it? in the 90s, real style. <laughs> Oh Guys, God. I was only born in the 90s. Oh, stop oh, it. Oh, Kayla. I'm sorry. I'm so young. <laughs> oh, that's okay. I think <laughs> the other thing that stands out to me, because it's still such uh, a thing in technology, is that, like, like, the big bad here is shaping up to be this, like, corporation. And this corporation yeah. that wants to control technology and the way technology is accessed by citizens and how that affects people and like I mean I make jokes all the time about Google being our evil overlords but at the same time like every digital device that I own basically is run through this one corporation so there's still mm -hmm. very much so that kind of pull between business and technology and hackers and kind of the individual user that's all still muddled together on the dark web. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there is so much in the book that is still relevant Definitely. today. You, you know, mm -hmm. the things that people bring up all the time about privacy concerns and how easy it is to pick up and, and track people through their data usage on the internet because everything finds out where you are and what you're doing and what you're looking at and what your habits are and all that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, it was really terrifying when I first got pregnant and had not told anybody but my husband. But Facebook was pitching me mom stuff on like the no. little ad <laughs> sidebar because the internet knows everything. Yeah. <laughs> All the time about everybody. <laughs> And another thing I think all of us have found is that it's quite refreshing in this book is there are loads of women in it. Yeah. Like, there are loads of men yeah. as well. But it's actually it's a world 50, that feels 50, like reality. <laughs> there are men and there are women and they are talking to each other and doing things together and they're friends and their yeah. family and their co-workers and mm -hmm. they're just all there together and it makes sense. <laughs> and it's so rare that it's almost laughable that we're finding this so cool. <laughs> I know, right? Like, oh my God, there's an equal number of men and women. Great what? Shocking. What is this craziness? I mean, it definitely, Revolution. but it's so nice because especially in science fiction, which although it is not, has a reputation for being very male dominated and male oriented. It is nice to see and that they are ladies who are like, doing things and mm -hmm. <laughs> making mm -hmm. significant contributions. I mean, it passes the Bechdel test with like flying oh, colors. Flying. So. Yeah, within like the first chapter or two, like, mm -hmm. it's going through it. And then by chapter four, it's like they're all hanging out in a kitchen and you're like, yep, yeah, yep. there you go. Like, <laughs> mm -hmm. Normal life. Yeah. And, and they're there doing the same computing stuff, which is great because, oh God, if there were more books like that around when I was a kid, I mean, this was around when I was a kid, but I wasn't reading it because I didn't <laughs> You were tapping it. into like, your Pat Cadigan no, in early elementary school, not. Elizabeth. <laughs> I should have what been. What were you doing? You know, you know more, more women at, like there making like punk computing stuff cool. That would have been amazing. Mm. Yeah, that's true. I mean, it sounds yeah. so bad, and this will probably further date myself, but I just keep thinking of Angelina Jolie in the movie Hackers, mm. another great 90s computer hacking classic, and just that she's yes. like hanging right in there, actually hacking and doing the same thing that the boys are doing yeah. with the same skill, and it's not a question. We pulled up an article, actually, didn't we, um, mm -hmm. that was relevant to this about how um, computer programming used to be women's work um, traditionally and it was advertised as such for years and years this was a, a women's profession and it was only much later and on purpose that it became known as a kind of like male dominated profession mm. and they actively tried to like bring more men in to professionalize i'm using air quotes here because it's really yeah, annoying all the scare quotes in the entire world <laughs> yeah um we'll link it in the show notes it's a really interesting mm -hmm. article um because if you think back to like computers were originally women were people they they computed numbers and calculated and things and then it was only and then they literally computed using the sort of original computers the early ones in the world war ii they were the ones like feeding in the tape and doing the punch cards and stuff and it, in the early times that was what it was and there were adverts for like you know become a computer coder it's all about planning just like planning a dinner party mm. it's just mm. hilarious when you Very read domestic. them now <laughs> yeah mm. that um, i'm throwing internet shade on that one i mean i get it <laughs> i understand it but i'm just yeah. like Ugh. Yeah, <laughs> I feel like you've got to like play that too. Like it was acceptable at the time. You said right. don't regularly throw dinner parties, Chelsea. Oh dear, <laughs> bitch, please. <laughs> we are ordering pizza all the time up in here. Planning Excellent. a dinner party is like, hey, the Chinese will be here at seven, so be home Reality. if you want to eat. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. But um, but then now that it's just the picture that is given out of like coding and engineering and all that is so male i would be yeah. like you think big bang theory and um what's the silicon valley mm -hmm. I, I was watching that and i quite enjoy it it is funny but i got into the end of i think season three whatever the current season is mm -hmm. and i'm so angry because there's still almost no female characters in it and the ones that are are not coders they mm. are the fund managers and the like assistants and stuff they brought in one female coder temporarily and then got rid of her and then 
every time they go to a computing fair, the women are pictured as like they were like manipulating the male coders around them to do their work for them, and I Ugh. just mm. just get not happy, me so angry because yeah. like, you couldn't have brought one extra person in to do that, not yeah. a single right. one. You couldn't have made one of those male characters female. It would have mm, that drastically <laughs> altered the whole course of your television show. Mm. And it's one of those things, it's such a reinforcing problem. The other thing the article mentioned is, as a way to get more males into the profession, they started instituting math tests and like logic problem solving puzzles, which at the time and continue today, math is a subject that is much more pushed on boys and is much more encouraged in young men than it is in young women that, I mean, it's still... I mean, I don't necessarily blame a lot of young women who may have an interest in coding who see nothing but males in the profession maybe being a little discouraged (laughs) from entering, which just breaks my heart and is so sad. Yeah, there are some really excellent um, sort of programs and meetups and things going on to try and improve this situation in the real world as Mm -hmm. well as its portrayal in... Um, the media. I mean, we we could just make everybody read Sinners. That would help. Um, but there's down. like the institution Girls Who Code and mm-hmm. um, the brilliant like Aminatu So who does <gasps> Holy Girlfriend. I love her She's involved so with um, like a women who code sort of function like women in tech companies. She's involved mm-hmm. with a lot of stuff like that. Um, so there are lots of institutions, and we'll try and leave a couple of links to some good things. Mm-hmm are out there yeah. but yes making everybody read sinners would be a good place to start yeah <laughs> with, with the caveat that they have to get to at least like chapter five before yeah. they make up <laughs> yeah. their mind because everything else is confusing <laughs> yeah it's one of those books but but so far we're enjoying it generally we are yeah now yes. that we've got and, into and, it and we're sort of understanding things and it's kind mm-hmm. of bringing up a lot of good discussion already so definitely yeah. will be interesting once we finish it and yeah. we'll be wrapping that up the next episode and i think yes. yeah it's one of those books where i almost feel like when we get to the end i'll want to go back and read the first couple of chapters again so that i yeah. can yeah, actually that- understand what is happening in them but <laughs> yeah i'm looking forward to finishing it and wrapping it up and seeing seeing how it all plays out it definitely gets better as it goes yeah which cool. is good because I didn't want to have to see Pat Cat again at Worldcon and then be like, "Uh, your book about that?" <laughs> no, definitely not. <laughs> okay, oh, shall man. we go on to what's new, Buzzy Cats? I believe Yay. so. Woohoo! Uh, so, let's see. Item number All one right. on the agenda. <laughs> All right, book shall Shubadon. we talk? Yeah, shall we, we talk the thing that's taking? The Booktube world by storm, Booktubeathon. Indeed. Booktubeathon. So, uh, so who's doing it? Let's start there. <laughs> Are any of us? I am it? not. <laughs> I'm not either. I don't think I am this year, but I think it's the <gasps> first one I haven't. So, yeah. Oh man. So for is you it really who don't possible know. that all three of us are not <laughs> doing Booktubeathon? I know. <laughs> For anybody who is not Aware. who is listening to this and is not sunk into the world of BookTube, um, every year there is a particularly big, like well-known readathon that is called the BookTubeathon, um, where lots of people join in and try and read a whole bunch of books. Is it over a week? Or? Yeah, it's the eighteenth so. to the twenty-fourth. So mm-hmm. it's a week yeah. and it's just to read as much as you can over that week, right? There's are there yeah, like challenges? And challenges? This as is well. how out of the loop I am. <laughs> There's some challenges. You don't have to do them, but there are quite a few different challenges. I think the aim is to try and go for like seven books or something. Seven books in seven days. There's also like like, choose a book with yellow on the cover and things like that. I'll put a link to Ariel's video with the challenges if people are Mm -hmm. interested. Yeah, it is. Yeah, it's hosted by Ariel Bissett, who is a wonderful and intelligent uh, Canadian and soon to be British. Uh, booktuber she's moving to the UK um well Imminently. yeah I think to London I'm not sure she said recently but I forgot <laughs> yeah <laughs> um but yeah it is usually I, I like Caitlin usually I would participate I feel like this year I am just getting a little burnt out on 
the thons in general. There was the Tome Topple Readathon and Genre Thon mm. and just several others. And usually I would lie to myself and convince myself I was going to read all of these things. But I am accepting defeat this year and just acknowledging <laughs> that it probably won't happen. Mm. I've only done one this year. I've only done the Tome Topple. But the reason I'm not doing Fictubathon is because my July TBR is already ridiculous. And so I don't think I can fit more books in <laughs> realistically. And a lot of the challenges, I'm one of those people who, if I do a readathon, I want to do the challenges. Mm -hmm. So I don't think I could fit a lot of the challenges with the books that I've already chosen for this mm. month's reading plans. I'm one of those people who kids themselves that they're going to do it and then and, and they could totally hit all of those challenges and then fails horribly and just goes, oh, we'll pretend that never I think happened. I've only actually completed Booktube on like once and actually done the challenges and then now that there's so much more going on because it's got much bigger this year, it's got yeah. the sponsorship, it's got stuff going on on Instagram, stuff going on in video challenges, like there's loads this year. Mm -hmm. um, I could not do all that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> There's just yeah. not enough time in the world for all of that. It is nice that it's getting big in that yeah. it encourages more people to join in and have fun. Like it goes beyond just people who make YouTube videos yeah, into definitely. people on Twitter and Instagram and blogs and mm -hmm. whatever and anything that brings communities together to have fun and, and to do with books is mm. lovely. Yeah, but it, it is kind of feeling overwhelming if you're trying to do all of it. Yeah. yeah. It's a little yeah. overwhelming. I'm feeling a little overwhelmed with the internet in general <laughs> at the moment. But uh, several years in the past, just searching Booktubeathon TBR on YouTube has actually led to a very good kind of like ex exploration of channels I'm not subscribed to mm -hmm. and, and new True. people and, wa and seeing kind of everybody's Tastes, I feel like as much as any TBR can be representative, the Booktubeathon TBRs tend to give like a pretty decent coverage of like who people are as readers and what they like and what kind of their focuses are and stuff. So I do yeah. like yeah. watching all the TBR videos, even if I'm not doing it. <laughs> yeah. And it's a good way in. I was talking to uh, Maya from Maya Reads mm -hmm. and she, um, only started booktubing because of the booktubeathon. Her first video was when she joined in with that two years ago. Yeah, um, I think so, lots of people are that way. I think yeah. a lot of them have anniversaries coming up because of booktubeathon. Yeah. So. Yeah. It's like a nice introduction into that kind Definitely. of scary it's world really, of really yourself. community driven, isn't well, it? And, yeah, so and it's great for community building. Yeah. Like, because it's on Twitter now and it's kind of grown more, it's great for building community and and finding the channels that you like and being able to have like a shared thing to talk about right away that's organized that's not just like hey i like books too we should be friends yeah which is how i started all my internet friendships by the way just in that fashion. who didn't I know, I didn't. I'm not that socially awkward most of the time. No. I think mostly you just made dick jokes at me until I wanted to, like, die from laughing. Boom. There you go, guys. You want to make friends, friends on, the internet? on the internet? Dick jokes. That's how. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it was a sassy reads thing, wasn't yeah, it, Elizabeth? It, it was, was. It was. We were doing some... It was Charles Dickens, I think, which, like... I mean, That was just, yeah, the puns. You want to talk about dick themselves. jokes? I mean, come on now. <laughs> Oh, oh man. wow! Oh, I don't. Guys. I don't think I was involved in this. Just so that you. I think know. it's when his doorknob turns into a face, and I was just like, just, <laughs> there, I don't need to be here to make the puns about this one. <laughs> oh man, I have never gift the internet so hard than I did when we were doing the sassy reads read along. <laughs> Oh, yeah. So I really honed my gifting skills on the internet. It was good times. So exciting. Yeah. So that's that's what's going on on YouTube. Yeah. So that's the YouTube update. Um, <laughs> yeah. Should we let's switch to the other thing that's taking the world by storm right now? Yes. And let's talk should. about Pokemon. Oh God. Oh God. <laughs> Pokemon now, Go. Yes. Do either of you have it yet? I have it. Nope. Yeah. You've got to join missed, us, Kill no. Chelsea. Join no. us. Mm -mm. But I, I will tell you guys. I that whole and, Pokemon bandwagon. Yeah, I was going to say, I've never played Pokemon until now. Like, in my whole life. 
which is so disappointing because I think I'd have I not been good. collected all the cards, but only the shiny ones. Oh yeah, I had because some I thought they were cards. pretty. Yeah, yeah. Um, I was the same. Like we used to be in school, and all the boys would play with Pokemon cards. Mm-hmm. They were really hardcore into it, and all the girls were like, "We don't like the game, but we love those shiny cards." So we'd just get all the shiny cards that the guys <laughs> like, didn't they want. They are very cute. Like the Pokemon yeah. themselves are like very cute. I actually Definitely. was going to the store yesterday, and on my first in-person, real-life sighting of someone playing Pokemon Go, there was oh, this like eighteen-year-old nice. kid on his skateboard, just like standing on the corner, looking at his phone, and like flicking the screen and I just like looked at him for a second and then I was like he's catching Pokemon this is an actual thing that is happening in my life like it's not just on the internet people are actually doing this yeah and then I kept driving and went to the store yeah it's so fascinating seeing it happen because I live right in the center of a quite a big town we've got Mm -hmm. loads and loads of Pokestops and Mm. Um, like places where people can gather and find loads of stuff. So people are, you'd see just people all the time on the streets and they'd like, you can see on the screen where like special lures have been put down. So it like, they like sprinkle confetti on the screen. And if you look where that is in real life, there's like always like a group of people just stood around talking Mm. and on their phones. And the first (laughs) night I had it like for the day I wa- went for a walk around my local town and as I was going back I saw one of these and I went over there and there was a bunch of people there and we just stood there like chatting away complete strangers mm-hmm. like for half an hour and they were lovely I've like I've never spoken to so many strangers in my hometown before I feel like that's the good thing about it is because like I don't know how it is in America Chelsea but in England people don't talk to each other in the street no, no. like people in America it's not don't a talk thing you do <laughs> No, we, people in America do not talk to each other. Yeah, okay. That is not a thing so, that happens. Well, I have maybe. lived in my house for like three years and I've never actually spoken to my neighbors. Yeah, nope. I mean, we Mm-mm. speak to the neighbors, but only because we have a low fence next to us. So we <laughs> have to. Like, that we can see into their driveway. So it would be very rude if we didn't. The other side, we've got a hedge. We don't talk to them. Yeah, so it's no. fine. But that like, whole like Norman Rockwell street, neighborhood yeah, block party just, thing does not happen. Yeah, I mean my road does that though. Like my road is one of those roads where people gather. We just don't go because <laughs> we're really socially awkward. <laughs> we went once and like there's a lot of very young families on my road, so it's a it's a little bit awkward just like sitting yeah. with my mum and my sister. Like this is fun, guys. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah being but, awkward in public is not on my list of high priorities exactly. so I usually just stay in my house all day so and get on the I internet. think in terms of like getting people to talk who would never normally have spoken to one another in the street then Pokemon is quite an interesting one because we yeah. went out the other day when I first got it um and I was like, Molly, we need to go out. Molly's my sister. Um, and we need to go out and catch Pokemon. I had to convince her for ages because she was not buying it. She was not into it. And then we finally did. And there was this young guy who was out there just like, buy this pokey stuff. And he was just sit there on his own. And Molly was like, I bet he's playing Pokemon. And he came over to us. And he was like, are you guys playing Pokemon? We were like, yeah. He was like, I've never seen anyone else. Because I live in quite a small <laughs> village. So there weren't many people. But it was quite funny. <laughs> Uh, I just think it's so cute that you can call it a village. We don't have those here. (laughs) We have gross suburbs and they're awful. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I don't know how, because I mean, it came, because it just came to the UK, right? Like, I think it came to the UK after it it debuted in America. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But in America, like, there's two sides to the same coin. Like, one, it's been really great for businesses. A lot of businesses have made themselves pokey stops, And so they're like, hey, come in and grab a cup of coffee. Or, like, the library <laughs> I work at has made itself a pokey stop. Oh, so they're cool. like, hey, come catch a Pokemon and then check out a book. Which, like, whatever. Mm-hmm. It's fine. I'll deal with people just randomly coming in to hunt Pokemon. <laughs> but, like, on the flip side of that, there are, like actual business emails being sent out that's like hey don't play pokemon go while you're at work or like don't yeah, drive and play pokemon go with like don't drive and pokemon <laughs> and i'm just like what the fuck who who are these people who are like driving down the road being like gotta catch them all <laughs> who cares what lane i'm in like what is driving and I'm just like, <laughs> well, oh they're going around our town problems as well haven't they like have you heard about all the people who've like broken into people's houses and yeah. stuff 
up. To try like, and catch Pokemon and gone in like oh, businesses. No, let's do, not do the media scare stories. There's <laughs> that about any big story, like any game or thing that's popular. Yeah, it's always and like, like but I feel like <laughs> I feel like people are just crazy. So this thing. is always like, going to happen. <laughs> I'm all for it, and I'm all for anything that gets people outside and yeah. like, moving around and having that social interaction. I think for yeah. me, it's just crazy, like. Because even actual Pokemon, I don't remember being as popular as Pokemon Go is. Like, it just seems like... It didn't have that sudden surge like this. This is crazy. And maybe that's just because of internet culture and technology and the Mm. way things are now versus the way they were in, like you know yeah. the late 90s early 2000s but like i someone tweeted yesterday and i don't remember who it was but they were like oh are you sorry about hearing about pokemon go welcome to every non-sports watcher's life for the last like forever, forever. and i'm like okay yeah. that's fair <laughs> that's fair so i'm sure it's just having like a surge right now but i'm just continually like shocked that <laughs> it is as big as it is yeah, and it is like true. huge it's crazy. Yeah. I had yeah. never heard of it before it came out. Like, I didn't know it was coming out or anything. And then I went on Twitter and it was just every person <laughs> was talking about mm-hmm. it. Elizabeth was talking about it a lot. So I was like, what is this thing? Yeah. It was like, every reading, I was too busy catching Pokemon. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> never mind. But and oh, I, well. I don't know. My inner anti establishment personality kicked in like <laughs> if that many people are doing it i refuse i will not join i yeah. will not play your that's pokemon kind of what game. my boyfriend's like like he loves pokemon as well he was like it's not as good there's no story in this one you just have to go out and talk to real people i was like oh, okay <laughs> never mind <laughs> oh shane i could just even be like you have to talk to people yeah i'm not about I'm not that i want to just sit in my hall of my house and play on my own <laughs> I did see a great picture online, which was um, the last week summed up in a single picture. And it was a line of riot police and somebody's phone trying to catch a Pokemon on one of the riot police's shield. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I've actually, yeah, that that will kind of move us to our next topic, because that is something that I actually said to my husband of like, this is the world we're living in. It is Black Lives Matter and police brutality and abject violence and pokemon yes like those yeah. are There's the edges of the internet scale that we are perched on today and i just think that that is um, yeah. absolutely insane for those who are not american or who are choosing to um stay off the news cycle at the moment um there have been two more um murders essentially of African-American men in the United States by police officers under highly suspect and suspicious circumstances. So that got the Black Lives Matter um, protest group and organization operating again, after which there was a third shooting in Dallas of a group of police officers by a sniper who was not associated with the Black Lives Matter movement, but it did happen at a Black Lives Matter protest. And so the whole internet, um, especially in America, but across the world in general, has just kind of exploded this week, both in luckily some positivity and some encouragement for a civil action and civil engagement, but also a lot of negativity and a lot of um, Mm -hmm. stupid people saying stupid things about Mm -hmm. other people and other races and other groups. And so that has definitely been something yeah, that's been going on <laughs> there has been a lot of positivity and that there's been a lot of discussion about the differences of experience and intersections between like you know we can talk about feminism but the black lives matter thing you know we've got to intersect feminism with with black life and because it's not the same for a white mm-hmm. woman as it is for a black woman and then it's not the same you know a black man's place in the patriarchal system is not the same as a white man's Mm -hmm. um and and the positions of privilege are so different that Mm. it it completely changes and and there's been a lot of stuff about that and it's been very interesting yeah there's been a lot of discourse on 
Black Lives Matter versus this kind of counter argument that a lot of people make of like, well, all lives matter. Oh, God. And I saw on Tumblr, somebody had posted a kind of a fake conversation that's like you go to your doctor and you're like, oh, doctor, my leg is broken. This bone is broken. Uh, This matters. And he goes, yeah, well, all bones matter. And you're like, well, yes, but Mm -hmm. this is the one that's broken. I would like to work on fixing this particular one. And so that for me is kind of a good embodiment of like, yeah. the flaws in that yeah, rhetoric definitely. and how that works um we're bringing it up or i'm bringing it up kind of specifically because it was mirrored by an article i read in uncanny magazine that talks about diversity and female representation um i will link the article in the show notes but and the article focuses largely on um uh, gender and sexual representation but the kind of um statements that it makes and the points that it puts forward are applicable to racial representation as well basically being that this kind of false dichotomy of kind of like we were talking about last week that uh aria stark versus sansa stark that very false dichotomy of these two different representations of women does a huge disservice to the genre of science fiction and fantasy as well as to the world at large and representation and that basically we all just need to do better (laughs) the publishing world needs to do better in representation of different forms of gender identity and embodying your gender and going outside of your that kind of cis hetero white framework that so much of literature in general has existed in for the past yeah forever Mm -hmm. (laughs) and the article goes through a lot of science fiction and fantasy like tv shows and movies and gives some really good examples of Mm -hmm. like what has happened Uh, the the one of the statistics that she gives is that there were 35 queer women on tv this year 10 of whom were killed off but already yeah Yeah. of the 35 and it's like Huh. Right, out of all the TV characters, you get yeah. 35 and 10 of them are already gone. Which is like, like 29%. Wow. I just did the math real quick. That's almost 30% of your queer characters just yeah, already it's dead. It's not good. Just gone. Nice. And she talks a lot about that's just for like established queer characters, characters that are, are canon established mm-hmm. as being queer. That doesn't even get into like queer baiting and some of the unspoken kind of representations of queerdom that TV shows enact but don't actually make explicit. She talks yeah. about queer baiting and supernatural. Um, that's what queer baiting is, by the way, uh, for anybody mm, who doesn't know. It is. <laughs> it is when a piece of media kind of implies that a character is queer or could be queer but doesn't actually make it textually explicit that that's what's happening. So she talks about Supernatural. I know that a lot of the Once Upon a Time community also got frustrated with that between some of the female characters who are clearly like implied to be in a, some kind of emotional relationship but weren't actually explicitly made lesbian. Um, so I just think that it's really interesting to kind of consider that those statistics only apply to canonically queer characters and don't even touch like possibly maybe queer characters Mm. yeah Um, yeah and then at the end she did mention and this just made my heart so happy because i ship poe and finn so hard (laughs) yes oh my god she did mention that it's not made explicit one way or the other in Star Wars The Force Awakens whether or not Rey will end up with either Finn or Poe or whether or not Finn or Poe are explicitly heterosexual and since in my book they are definitely not <laughs> I was fully there for that that like hey keep my jacket it looks good on you wink <laughs> made the whole movie like that was the whole movie for me i was like that's that's where it's at (laughs) yeah oh dear me good um oh man yes what else have we been looking at um i found a really interesting um book that i think 
you guys were quite excited to see as well. Yes, mm. uh, Someone just mentioned it to me on Twitter, and it's called The Secret Loves of Geek Girls. This was originally a Kickstarter, I think, last year or the year before, uh, organised by Hope Nicholson. Um, and it's an all-female comic um, graphic novel anthology type thing about women and who they love and what they love and things they're interested in and um, it includes stories, original graphic stories from Margaret Atwood <gasps> along with all kinds of like other amazing authors and um, artists and just like this huge list of amazing women and this originally came out just for the Kickstarter backers and then there was a, a short run of it and it's I think that edition is still available possibly second hand I'm not sure it's still available but anyway they're bringing out a new edition of it in o October this year and I'm like hey, I'm so so there because this sounds amazing yeah oh does. I hit pre-order so fast when you put yeah. that link in our <laughs> show notes I was yeah. like what done I mean Margaret Atwood sold me she'll she could sell me on almost anything but yeah basically like yeah, it's got Marjorie M. Lou who writes Monstrous, so I'm, yeah. like, I'm like, there. Oh, <laughs> yeah, so monstrous. we will leave a link to it so you can admire what looks like going to be an amazing read. And Noelle because... Stevenson as well. Oh, Just yeah. like all the great people. All the wonderful oh, yeah. ladies. And it excites me because it's like, it's going to introduce me to so many more. Yeah. So I can be even more mm -hmm. excited. Yeah, it's, it looks really good. This Definitely. is why anthologies are so good. When mm. you find a good one, you're just like, yes, hello, introduce me to the people that I am about to love, like, because mm -hmm. it's a great way of getting a taster of so many good, yeah. like, interesting creators. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Plus it's graphic and, like, short stories in flash fiction, so it's going to be really interesting to see how those two mediums, like, interplay yeah. in that anthology in that way. I'm really excited to see how that comes yeah. across. Yeah. It's, like it's a nice. It's nice. I'd like to see more like mixtures of stuff mm -hmm. together yeah. because it's always lovely when there's more art in things. But if you can mix together that like graphic novel, short story, get your brain working. Mm -hmm. Okay, so next thing on the agenda: awards. As you guys probably know, loads of awards have just released their shortlists. Um, so the three that we're going to be talking about are. The British Fantasy Awards, which are obviously British, and they have nominations from people who have a British Fantasy membership and then also have a panel to decide the final winners. We have the Gemmel Awards, which are nominated... I'm not sure who by, actually, but... Anybody on the internet. Oh, is yeah. anyone? Okay, okay. So internet. nominated by anyone on the internet and then voted by anyone on the internet, so that's just open to the internet. <laughs> Um, and then we have the World Fantasy Awards as well, which I think you have to have a membership to the World Fantasy Awards to nominate in it's those. It's to the World um, Fantasy um, convention. convention. Okay, the World Fantasy Convention to actually participate in the voting and such for them. So, should we go for the Gemmels first to get them out of the way? <laughs> yes, that's... Okay, so Gemmel Awards... Um, these are a fantasy award after uh, David Jamal. Yeah, mm -hmm. I believe so. Um, and yeah, the shortlist I was not that excited by, but then it's, it's not so my many style. Dudes. Yeah, no, it's... I think the one that I'm always most interested in with the Jamals is the cover up. <laughs> Because yeah. I like so, yeah, seeing the, what's popular in the cover art section. <laughs> yeah, the Gemmels do best novel, best debut, and best cover art. Yeah, um, and, and you get five, five or five six. In each, yeah, five or six nominees in each. That's yeah, the I think five. Best debut has six. Yeah, this year there was a tie in best debut, so there are yeah. six. Yeah, no, being open to the internet and. David Jamal being popular with his particular audience, this I have seen and heard discussed tends to be a very male trad fantasy. Uh, yeah, I, did, I kind of want to say conservative, but mm -hmm. I don't know if that's the right word. But traditional, I like, would say traditional. Yeah. Definitely. Um, and yeah. this has kind of come out this year as well, although it's a little bit better in the best debut section, but the yeah. best novel section is 
best dude, novels. Dude, 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 dude. <laughs> yeah. Most of and, them very well known. Most yeah. of them white. <laughs> In fact, maybe all of them, I'm not sure. Um, <laughs> yeah, there is only definitely one. definitely at least three of them. There is only one female on the list, and that is Saba Tahir. Um, oh, there's Francesca wrote... Haig in Best Day oh, okay. as well. Okay, I missed her, so. And Lucy yeah. Hansen. I'm just wrong. Just ignore me. I'm <laughs> yeah, just yeah, that you don't know what I'm talking about. Much more mixed, but the yeah. the best novel is is All Guys, I believe. So, and yeah. I'm a little surprised to see The Traitor by Seth Dickinson, which was released in the U.S. as the Traitor Baru Cormorant, because that one yeah. definitely has some... That one's a really Marmite book. Yeah, and it has some non-traditional elements to That's it. True, and, actually, yeah. And family structures, at least in the beginning. So that mm-hmm. one is kind of sticking out to me on the list as being a little... Yeah. Not One of these things is not like the others. <laughs> so. Yeah. In, and Ember in the Ashes, isn't that... That's Sabata here's... Um, isn't that a YA as well? It is. It is I indeed. Think it is, so that's yeah. an exciting... So there's there's changes happening. They did say last year, the, the award ceremony last year was at Nine Worlds and I was helping out at it. And they did say they are working to try and encourage, you know, a more diverse nominating, like, people sort of thing because but it's very hard and slow to change an award yeah I mean, yeah I especially for like, like a general public is. award where it's like you know everyone's got their own opinion you yeah can't always change that on the but like internet, promoting so. it in certain ways and yeah. trying to open it and and push it at certain populations outside of your core demographic who are always going to vote anyway because Mm -hmm. the British Fantasy Awards had a similar issue they basically kind of turned into a horror award Mm -hmm. for a while despite their name it it is all for years it was dominated by horror books and it still has a a strong horror contingent and it has a best horror award I think doesn't it? Yeah I think Mm -hmm. it does. Yep best horror Um, novel. Mm -hmm. Yeah but they promoted the convention and the award outside of their the way they had been and it started to change a little bit Mm. Um, and they found new people and new things it's that same way as like when conventions start getting a bit old and then it's not being talked about outside of the people who always go yeah I think that's the thing as well with like the general just having a look at the list of the cover art section and the best novel section there's three that are in both and it's the same book so I think of all the books in the world (laughs) for three of them to be in both categories shows that it is the same people voting Mm -hmm. right now so opening it up and hopefully advertising to a bit more people in the coming years might change that yeah and um I mean to be fair to the general awards they do have like some pretty fun trophies um you get <laughs> that's the important stuff we all know you get like a huge axe as the excellent as the legend award. yeah because that's his um his was, thing his symbol wasn't it yeah, yeah. I think. Mm-hmm. but you get I one and that. it's like when we were at the awards like that they were the trophies were like on the stage and i was like <laughs> there's a big axe on the stage <laughs> yes i'm gonna get you yeah be careful. So that's the Gemma Awards. Yes. Let's go on to the British Fantasy Awards then. Yeah, so, so this is... Uh, we were quite interested. We were looking up how this yeah. was nominated and voted on. Um, and the nominations are done by anybody with a membership to the... Um, British Fantasy Society. The Society or who has a membership to the convention, yeah. which happens every like autumn in the yeah. UK. And... But they only nominate four for each category. Then there's a jury for each category, and they can add two to the shortlist that they felt were egregious omissions, which is, like, my new favourite. Which, yeah, right. like, that language is just, <laughs> like, on point. Um, yeah. <laughs> and, um, and, then, and then the jury themselves read and vote on the winner. So mm-hmm. it's an interesting combo that compared to like how other awards are chosen yeah definitely i just want to say this is just it's a little specific but i take umbrage with the inclusion of welcome to night vale in the best horror novel category it's not exactly horror is it no it's really not and i love (laughs) night vale and i really liked that book but that is not a horror novel it is, you know, there are some creepy elements to it, but <laughs> BFAs, 
What are, what are you doing, guys? What are you doing? Well, What's going on? I mean, I guess it's a bit like uh, the Hugo Awards where they're not going to take something out mm-hmm. because yeah. if the group of people who nominated it say Put it's it a in. horror novel, yeah. it's a horror then, novel. Yeah. Yeah. Which is fine. I guess I just am disagreeing with the society on that one. <laughs> you just saying no. Disagree. <laughs> but, on the novellas, um, actually, I notice I have read three of the novellas, so that's mm-hmm. quite good of me for once. Yeah. <laughs> I'm quite happy. They are all and tall I, ones. Yeah. But, and I always like yeah. uh, film and television categories. I always think those are probably the ones that are going to be most known by the largest group of people. Mm-hmm. Like, not everyone may have read certain books, but I guarantee you almost everyone has seen Star Wars yeah, or has, probably. you know, a large portion of people have seen Mad Max. And so I always am really interested in seeing what gets nominated in that category. Yeah. There are lots of categories for the British Fantasy Awards, mm-hmm. which yeah. in yes. one way is like, wow, that's going to create like a lot of small categories but also it's a really good way of introducing you to new stuff because i'm looking through this and thinking i have not heard of half of these things Mm -hmm. so you know some stuff's probably worth a look and trying to have a read of like all kinds of exciting things and do we know what the date range is like do we know if it has to be published in 2015 to be nominated I, I would so. guess so. I would assume so, but <laughs> I would think so, but I'm not okay. certain. Yeah, probably. I'm just. I was just curious. Yeah, but it looks like it, given the there's some yeah, familiar they're titles. All, mm-hmm. They're all familiar, recent um, titles. Becky Chambers is that, of course we're very excited by that. <laughs> the newcomers. The best newcomer. the best newcomer section is a very good. Like there's Becky Chambers for the small long way to a small angry planet, which we all love. Yeah. Oh, so uh, but there's love. also Zencho's Sorcerer to the Crown, which yeah. I love. Which was I, so like, good. Such a sweetheart. So good. Um, <laughs> Peter Newman, who is a very nice chap. Yeah, I haven't read his book. Yet, <laughs> I haven't read the book, but to. he's, he's a very, very nice, nice isn't he? I love him on PhD. <laughs> <laughs> he's a very nice, very nice gentleman. <laughs> um, yeah, and I haven't I heard haven't of the heard other of Stephen two. Paul, but Mark Turner is fantasy. I know that much. When mm. the heavens fall, I haven't got it, but. It looks good, so I probably will. Yeah, and I like the um, the best magazine periodical thing includes Strange Horizons, which I love. <laughs> so um, good, excellent. Yeah, and Interzone, which is one of the few magazines that still comes out in paper, which is mm-hmm. just going to say I, I don't know Interzone. Yeah, it's a British um, magazine, and it still comes out in a lovely, like, really well bound. Oh. Um, issue like every two months I think it is and it's Sounds it's cool. very nice indeed um, yeah. we have some yeah. some badass ladies cleaning up in the graphic novel division with Bitch Planet oh, yeah. and Miss Marvel and Nimona and Red Sonia lots of lo- and Sandman because <laughs> obviously <laughs> because it's Sandman obviously yep. But yeah, much more happy with the BFA list than with the yeah, I general like is, nominations. Is a much better <laughs> yeah, list, so it's cool. a very different like mm-hmm. set of nominee nominators. Yeah, so. that's true. Uh, and then what was the third one? World the fantasy. The third one is the world fantasy. Yep, awards the world fantasies. So, so this one, the novels are very interesting. Best yeah. novels, much mm-hmm. broader, like. This is a quite a prestigious award. This one, mm, um, so we like, got you know up there with the Hugo's kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, when we've got that reflected, I think a little bit in the novels and stuff. There are similar nominations, yeah. mm. and so I'm not got, quite like, as surprised by the novel nominees like for this one as no. I was for no. some of the other ones. I like of all. If I could have predicted a list, my list probably would have looked the most like this list yeah. of yeah. things that were published. Well, this is nominated by members of the convention, mm-hmm. isn't it? And yeah. it's the convention is tends to be quite limited, and it tends to be very industry heavy. Mm-hmm. Um, it's all, apparently it's always a lovely convention, so I wouldn't mind going. <laughs> well, hey, it's in Ohio this year. Come on yeah. down. Come to America. <laughs> Go to Ohio. Oh, don't do that. <laughs> Are they changing the? Um, prize the trophy this year because it was Lovecraft's face which was the big controversy yeah, yeah and then they I'm got rid sure of that they're, they're dropping that, that but I think I for good they, reason 
Yeah. 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 Um, so they announced after the last one that they were dropping Lovecraft. Yeah. So that means there's a new trophy this year. Ooh. Have That's they announced exciting. That, do we think, or is it going to be a surprise? I don't know. Don't Quick know. Google. <laughs> I haven't As I heard say, anything now we're all about googling it. what the trophy will look like. I haven't heard anything about it, so nor have I. I haven't heard since they dropped when the it love comes craft. out. It'll be a big deal, so I'm guessing they'll do it at the ceremony. Yeah, maybe it'll be a big surprise. Ooh. Um, but yeah, the novels list is *The Buried Giant* by Kazuo Ishiguro, um, yeah. *The Fifth Season* by N.K. Jemison. Uprooted by Naomi Novik, Savages by K.J. Parker, The Chimes by Anna Smale, and A Head Full of Ghosts by Paul Tremblay. Mm. Not bad, not bad. Yeah. yeah. And then it's got uh, Lifetime Achievement Awards going to David G. Hartwell and Andrzej Sapkowski, who is the author of The Witcher novels, uh-huh. which I have read and are fantastic. Yeah, I have the first one to read, actually. Mm-hmm. Yeah, my husband's really super into the video game, so we read them together. <laughs> nice. Yeah. Um, I was quite pleased to see in the special award non-professional, and by non-professional they just mean they don't make a specific proportion of their income from doing these things, like either publishing or writing or whatever it is. Yeah. Um, there were two little ones <laughs> close to my heart, which was um, Alex and Elisa from... Um, the Galactic Suburbia for their Letters to T- Tip Tree anthology, mm-hmm. um, which is very <coughs> exciting. And Lynn and Michael Thomas the from Thomas Magazine. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yay. I just Two tweeted it favorites. the other day, but like, Aunt Uncanny has been killing it, man. Oh, they are on fire. Yeah, <laughs> they are one good. of the few collections where I know that like every time it comes out, like, kids, you know, some collections are mixed, and you're like, couple five star, couple three star, couple like that you just don't read. But Uncanny, I am there. I am there for everything they're publishing. It is great. The Thomases yeah. are doing wonderful work at Uncanny. And yeah, in the, it is the good. there's two short fiction nominees were published in Uncanny. So there's Pockets by Amal El Motar, which has been nominated for other things as well. Mm-hmm. Um, and then there's The Heat of Us, Notes Towards an Oral History by Sam J. Miller, which yeah. was phenomenal. It's um, a retelling of Stonewall, Ooh. but with a, a uncanny type fantasy twist. Mm-hmm. And cool. oh my God, I loved it. I think it was in issue two. Check that one and out. Issue it looks two like of it. Uncanny yeah. was, oh my God, it was, I, I, I think I reviewed it on my blog and I was just like, I, there aren't enough stars for this magazine. <laughs> Yeah, the oh, short cool. fiction nominee from Nightmare, Hungry Daughters of Starving Mothers, was that story creeped the fuck out of me for like <laughs> a long time. Uh, <laughs> nice. Nightmare Magazine is another one of my favorite uh, short story subscriptions, but that one in particular was, it was good. I'm so behind <laughs> on the stuff. short stories. I really oh, need so to get I, back but... to uh, reading them regularly again. Because I know you've been loving them recently, Chelsea. I saw your Oh, I don't know what <laughs> happened. I just like was reading all of these big books and then something in my brain was like yep nope not doing that anymore and the last couple months it's been all like clerk's world and nightmare and uncanny and it's just i'm all about that short fiction right now guys i don't know what's happening i really loved it the start of the year i need to get back into it because i really enjoy it when i am into one of them i think it might be because after i funded the light speed people of color campaign for their Mm, special issue it came with like all of the back issues for yeah. Lightspeed and for Nightmare Magazine. And so now I just have like <laughs> 50 million issues of <laughs> short yeah. story magazines. So I just am feeling enriched by all of these collections at my disposal, which is wonderful. Yeah, awesome. That is exciting. Yeah. That is very cool. On which note, shall we finish off by talking about what we're reading? Yeah, that sounds what good. Currently so tell reading. us, Chelsea, what exciting things are you reading? Which oh, magazines? God. Uh, let's see. Well, I have just finished a back issue of Nightmare Magazine. I read Queers Destroy Horror, which nice. I started shortly after the Orlando shootings happened, and I absolutely loved. I think my favorite was one of the first stories, um, which was a reimagining of, um, oh, shit. 
that Oscar Wilde story <laughs> with the picture where he's the, the dude. Portrait of picture Dorian of Dorian Gray. Gray. There we go. <laughs> we can just edit out that first part where I had no idea what the fuck I was talking about. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, I think we'll leave that. Yeah, oh, that yeah. is a it's a retelling of the picture of Dorian Gray where Dorian Gray is alive in 1980s San Francisco. Oh, and fantastic. all of his lovers are. Um, exposed to and die from the AIDS virus and he remains oh, so cool. unable to contract the disease and so it plays really well with that kind of physical embodiment of illness and all this stuff I could talk about it for a really long time but I won't yeah <laughs> no that sounds cool um, that sounds cool and then kind of along with that I am starting a couple pieces of nonfiction. I am starting a book called The Lynching which was, is about a Supreme Court case against the Ku Klux Klan that made some pretty serious headway in racial politics in America. And then I'm also starting Dance Macabre by Stephen King, which is kind of a look at how horror works as a genre and why we read horror and why some horror works for some people and other horror works for others. So yeah, I'm in a really horror mood at the moment, which is a little <laughs> weird for me because that usually doesn't hit until closer to October, November. But Mm -hmm. Maybe not this year. <laughs> rocking it this year. Yeah, I'm just I'm all over it. What about you, Caitlin? What are you reading? Um, I am reading The Countenance Divine, which oh. is not actually out yet, but it will be out soon. I think I've been thinking I really month. need to pick that up and actually read it's it now. It's so weird, but I really like it. It's mm. like one of those books that jumps around time periods. So you follow a 19 99 the year 1999 you follow a character and then that character meets another character who's doing an art exhibition all about people from history and then you go back to the people from history that the art exhibition's about and oh, you follow their cool. storyline and then you go back again and you go back like by about 100 years each time and stuff so it's, it's pretty um, interesting 99 1888 yeah 1770 like that yeah isn't it? it goes back to 1666 so i yeah. love shit like that cool i love one. like formats like that that sounds yeah really cool. and like every section is sort of written in a very different way so you're following like I, I think you're following Jack the Ripper um, as a character <laughs> and it's quite interesting to sort of see <laughs> that as a character um, so it's really really weird so far but I like it a lot and what else am I currently reading? I think there's a few others I'm reading Emperor of the Eight Islands which is a sort of um, YA Japanese inspired sort of fantasy it's got some magic in there there's like a crazy mask that you can control nature with and stuff so that's pretty cool um and then those are the two i'm actively reading and then sinners um and then i really need to get back to among others because i haven't got very far it's with that so one yet good, I, <laughs> so I know good. i know guys I'm i have a review it. going up for it on my channel next week and i just literally I, am like at the camera i'm being liking like, it it's i just amazing. need to like dedicate the time to sit down and read it so as soon as i finish one of the other books i just yeah. mentioned that will it's be the one it's just such a lovely song. little it's just i just i like it so far i'm i'm only about 10 percent in this yeah. so oh keep going far. it's so good it's so good i will i, will. It, I think i'll like it yeah. definitely what about you elizabeth what are you reading i am still working my way through Pedido street station oh um, yeah, well that is a monster mm, so i don't blame you yeah mm -hmm. <laughs> big um <laughs> And, and and not nice at all. Oh my God, it's bleak. <laughs> oh no. Uh, so as well as that, I have Sinners on the go. So that's yeah, interesting. That's and sinners. the one that is bringing any lightness to my life is um, <laughs> The Book of Phoenix by Nnedi Okorafor, which so far <gasps> yes! is so good. <laughs> it's so Just good. Just loved it. Yeah. So the opening chapter of that I was just like oh I could just hear it being read it was fantastic and then we switch over to Phoenix's point of view and I was like oh interesting oh cunning because it's like at first I was like oh it's super old-fashioned like history stuff and then I was like nope nope they have technology oh this is mm -hmm. this is interesting oh Ooh. so yeah I am very intrigued like cool I have that like, one I need to get to yeah, yeah. So. it's so good and then you have to Glad read who fears to death like right enjoying. after that oh yeah yeah the two okay. of them together are just like <laughs> it's fire it, they're so yeah good. But I always feel like if I'm going to pick up an Eddie Okorafor thing, it's going to be really interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, she does yeah. interesting stuff. I was say, even yeah. if you don't love it, there's definitely going to be some stuff in there that's 
interesting yeah, just, and worth looking at and stuff so yeah it, it's really refreshing i think because it's just not like picking up a trad fantasy book which just mm-hmm. after a while they just start making me go oh god i don't care don't you say that about my fantasy <laughs> 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 no you are right i do have to break it up sometimes it's just like seeing <laughs> just something simple like you know mythological creatures that aren't the standard yeah, European yeah, it's always ones. interesting when you get something. And, yeah. yeah, I mean, it's different. the same with Kedido Street Station. He's invented this, like, very big epic fantasy world mm. that's populated by nothing that's come out of, like, loads and loads of, of typical that trad fantasy, fantasy stuff. Yeah, there's loads yeah. of races and loads of beings and mythologies but they're not Mm. the ones that you're familiar with Mm -hmm. that's cool whereas i'm just over here listening to my brandon sanderson and (laughs) listening to the second stormlight book which is literally as trad fantasy oh my god i I could not read that book i couldn't (laughs) fucking crab fairies see crab fairies are not traditional though (laughs) crab fairies (laughs) Oh, Chelsea's died. I think you killed her. <laughs> now every time I plug in yeah. my headphones, I'm just going to be like, fucking crab fairies. <laughs> that was very much what I got from the book one. Was like, well, oh. well I, I think that's the main point, audio, really. And then it went away, and then I got it back like four months later. So I'm just trying to like re-catch up on the 500 pages. That's all right. The next like book's probably not out until sometime next year, I think. Oh, man. I don't want to, but I am a completist, so I know I'm going to end up buying it, and then it's going <laughs> to sit there, and he's going to die the before they're done, out. like Robert Jordan did. If he keeps and... going the way he's been going, that one is going to be 2,000 pages long. Oh, God. Maybe, yeah. yeah. I just um, want to be like, stop yeah. writing it. Go back to Mistborn. Go back to Mistborn. <laughs> I yeah, like go and write those new Miss One series that yeah. are going to be awesome, please. Right, <laughs> that is what we've been reading. Yes. Um, <laughs> and that is probably all we've got scheduled, and we've been talking for quite some time, yes, so we should wrap it up. this a particularly long one. But next okay. episode, yes. yeah, next episode we will be wrapping up Sinners and discussing... Um, what happened in it and some more thoughts on it and what came out, what happened in the in the plot and how that relates to a ladies in real life mm-hmm. um and also more about news and what's going on in the world mm-hmm. and then we will be launching our next look into the lady vault which will be a fantasy book so we'll alternate yes. from science fiction to fantasy but we won't choose it until next next episode yeah so we look forward to the like talking to you guys in two weeks time in the Absolutely. meantime yeah follow thanks us on for listening. twitter email us let yes. us know that you've listened to the episode and we'll see you next